It's 67 words long, it's 100 years old, and it changed the course of history for the Middle East and the Jewish people. The Balfour Declaration, the expression of the British government's support for a Jewish home in Palestine, was sent by British Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour to the second Lord Rothschild. I'm here in Buckinghamshire at Waddesdon Manor to speak with the fourth Lord Rothschild about the Balfour Declaration, what it means for Britain, for the Jewish people and the Rothschild family. The Foreign Office, November the 2nd, 1917. Dear Lord Rothschild, I have much pleasure in conveying to you, on behalf of His Majesty's Government, the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations, which has been submitted to and approved by the Cabinet. So it's possibly the most famous letter in modern Jewish history, and it begins with three words. Dear Lord Rothschild, why was it that this letter was sent by the Foreign Secretary to your great uncle Walter? It's an interesting question because he was really interested in ornithology, <laughs> although he became interested in Zionism. I think the reason was this, that it was primarily a movement from Eastern Europe, but they didn't clarify who was in charge of that movement. And in addition, it was after all in Great Britain. So they felt that the Rothschild family um, should be the one to whom it was addressed. And Walter was Lord Rothschild and he was uh, a Zionist. And um, those really are the background reasons. So Walter received the Balfour Declaration and, and I have a copy here. And I wonder if I could possibly ask you to read it for us. Yes, indeed. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm going to put on my spectacles to make sure I read it accurately. His Majesty's Government view with favour the establishment of Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavours to facilitate the achievement of this object it being clearly understood that nothing should be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. I should be grateful if you would bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation. Yours, Arthur Balfour. And here it is, the Balfour Declaration. What do you feel when you, when you see it here? I genuinely feel it's one of the most extraordinary moments in the history of the Jewish people. Uh, if you think it took 3,000 years uh, to get to this. And then you say, how did this miracle happen? And it's the most incredible piece of opportunism. I mean, if you think you had an impoverished uh, would-be scientist, Heim Weizmann, who somehow gets to England, meets a few people, including members of my family, seduces them, he has such great charm and conviction. He gets to Balfour, and he unbelievably persuades Balfour and Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, and most of the ministers, that this idea of um, the national home for um, Jews should be allowed to take place. I mean, it's so, so unlikely. It, it and then he you know, starts to fight a difficult battle with the British cabinet, and this uh, letter goes through five drafts, as you know. And in the end, it comes out as a rather compromising letter. I mean, the essential point is there for um, the Jewish community to fasten on to. You have the first bit, which promises a national home rather than the national home. And then you have the bit that nothing that's to be done should um, in any way harm the Arab community. But you come back to the big point, which is that this is perhaps the greatest event in Jewish life for thousands of years. And it's a miracle that it took place. And of course, the Rothschild family then as now filled two roles because it wasn't just a leader of diaspora Jewry. It also played a very significant role in the early years of the establishment of the pioneer communities in Israel as well. There were two branches of the Rothschild family primarily concerned. One in France through Baron Edmond Rothschild, who was the 
one who responded to the Russian programs of the 1880s. In England, there was a divide. Um, some of the Rothschilds, in particular Baron Edmond's son, uh, James, known as Jimmy, had come from France, partly because of the Dreyfus case and his horror about what had happened, to live in England. He was educated at Cambridge University. And he married an English girl, Mrs. James de Rothschild, and she became a leader at a very young age. She was only 17 when she started writing to Weizmann and introducing him to um, the British establishment. Other Rothschilds felt it was better to be assimilated into English life, and although they retained their interest in Judaism and Jewish life, they didn't think it was a good thing that this national home should be established in Israel. So it was something that divided my family, as with many other families. I wonder, as somebody who moves in the highest echelons of British society and is very close to Israel, whether you in your life feel a tension between concern for Israel and loyalty to Britain? No, I don't personally feel that. I mean, I've been completely committed to Israel since the early 1960s and have been there every year since. So I don't feel that conflict, but I, have, of course, feel a huge loyalty to Great Britain. Uh, just tell us a little bit more about Walter, the second Lord Rothschild, because he was a, an unusual and colourful character. He, he was a deeply eccentric man. But from a very early age, his passion was collecting. Um, he rode a bike ring park on a giant tortoise. <laughs> he had a zebra uh, carriage. A he, carriage pulled by zebras. Yes. Um, he collected on a massive scale birds, insects, fleas, it was the, 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 the largest single collection created by a single individual. I think that's true. I think certainly in Great Britain, I think probably anywhere, uh, he was the greatest collector of ornithological material. His, his niece, Miriam, writes that, that for two years, as one of his eccentricities, he didn't open any of the letters that were sent to him and stuffed them away into wicker baskets. And it does make you wonder what would have happened if the Balfour Declaration, the letter, had been one of those letters that he'd actually, you know, <laughs> yes, stuffed. That's, that's, that's true. At that stage, and it's very difficult to quite understand why, he had taken a deep interest in what was happening about the possible to Balfour Declaration. So maybe those letters <laughs> would have got to the top of his part. <laughs> I just want to revisit for a moment your cousin Dorothy, who yes. you mentioned. Uh, who at an extraordinarily young age, still in her teens, played such a yeah. critical role as a go-between and a, and a facilitator for Chaim Weizmann. Can you say a little bit about well, her? Well, she married my cousin Jimmy uh, when she was 17. So this is, um, this is your cousin Dorothy, Dolly. Yeah, this is James de Rothschild. And from her teenage years onwards, she was a major supporter of Israel, wasn't major she? Major supporter. I mean, she worshipped her husband, who'd been deeply committed, um, son of Baron Edmore. It was due to him, I think, that she became interested. But once she became interested, she became passionately interested. After his death, she became even more committed. She just wanted to carry out his wishes and what he cared deeply about. And then she had her own personality, a deeply good human being who was quite unselfish. She devoted herself to this place, to Israel, and to a few friends, and had a wonderful life. And you can read <clears throat> letters from her to Weizmann and from Weizmann to her when she was only 17. And what she did, which was crucially important, was to connect up Weizmann with the British establishment. I well, think she also trained him in how to deal. She helped and, educate how, how to conduct himself. And it's an extraordinary at that age, but she did sort of <laughs> tell Weizmann, you know, how to um, kind of integrate, <laughs> how to insert himself into British establishment life, which he learned very quickly. So I'm here in the Waddesdon Manor archives where there is a treasure trove of remarkable documents from the time of the Balfour Declaration. 
we have the correspondence here between the teenage Dorothy and her husband James. And it, it's really a love story. Here Dorothy is writing to James. She says, Jimmy, I thought I would not like one day to pass without giving you a piece of news you have never heard before. I love you. But of course their correspondence wasn't just romantic correspondence. Here we have detailed letters describing her dealings with Zionist leaders, her advice and her suggestions regarding the, the conferences of the Zionist movement. And here we have a letter that the young Dorothy, still not 20, sent to Dr. Chaim Weizmann, where she's talking about the meetings that she's arranged for him. And as we've heard, she was helpful in, in training and preparing him to enter into the highest echelons of British society to advance the cause of the Zionist movement. And she was an important character in your life as well. She really introduced you to Israel in some She way. was a crucially important character in my life. I became a trustee of Yad Hanadib over 50 years ago. Which is the, the Rothschild Philanthropic Foundation. Yes, that being our foundation. And um, <clears throat> I think I first went in 1962. Can you share with us your sense of what things have been changing in Israel since that first visit? Yes. As Israel, I think, became more and more successful <clears throat> in all sorts of ways, um, industrially successful, absorption successful, technologically successful, great universities, the problems with the wars that took place, being the clearest examples of security, became more paramount. And so you did see a shift um, in Israel um, from kind of the liberal Western um, place that it had been in the early 60s to something of a very different character. And you also have a shift, of course, between communities in Israel. I mean, Israel is a patchwork of different immigrants from different countries. And you have the religious, um, you have the non-religious, you have a town like Tel Aviv, which is attractive to the kind of business community, to what I would call ordinary city life. And then you have Jerusalem, which remains a very religious city um, and full of conflict between Arab neighbors and itself. Those internal issues within the fabric of Israeli society are one of the, the main focuses of Yad HaNadiv. Can you mention just one or two of the projects that feel to you most significant? Y yes. We do a great deal of work on education, a great deal of academic work. We keep going at Ramat HaNadiv, the garden where Baron Edmond was eventually buried. We're on the point of building the n new National Library of Israel. Uh, two unexpected ones, perhaps. If you take the Orthodox community, it's important that they have employment. And we're trying to develop programs which it's possible for them uh, to undertake. Similarly, you have a problem with Arab unemployment. And we set up jointly with the government employment centers to facilitate um, greater employment of Arabs um, uh, within Israel. And so we're an active foundation trying to um, help with these fissures in Israeli life and to do some good. And, and we're sitting here looking forward to the 100th anniversary of this significant letter. If I can just ask you to think about the next centennial, a hundred years time, <laughs> and just maybe share some of your hopes, your aspirations about where Israel will be. Um, what does one hope for? One of course hopes for a peaceful relationship uh, with Israel's neighbors, and that's going to be the most difficult matter of all to achieve. But even now you can see with the disarray in the Middle East, and the importance of relationships that Israel is developing, not only with Jordan, but also with Egypt, and indeed with Saudi Arabia, even if they're not publicized because of the Sunni Shiite war. There's hope. And I think if you take the need of Arab nations uh, to have 
intelligence help. And if on the other hand you take compassion and generosity coming from Israel to Palestinian territories and its less fortunate neighbours, there are grounds for optimism. And I am an optimist. Lord Rothschild, thank you very much indeed. No, thank you. So as we've heard, it was a remarkable moment of historic opportunity, a meeting of British interests and Jewish hopes, and most especially of a remarkable group of individuals. Arthur Balfour, British Foreign Secretary, Chaim Weizmann, a yeshiva student turned chemist, Lord Walter Rothschild, a zoologist come Zionist activist, and Dorothy, a teenage girl who became a political go-between. It's a moment that teaches us about the power of historic events to shape our lives, but more than that, about the power of individuals to shape the future. <laughs>